Hello, I hope you're doing well. We are talking about music on the Apple IIGS with Ninja Tracker Plus or NTP for short. I'm Jesse Blue from Ninja Force. If you have a GS, you might have already seen the stuff we released in the past. We mostly created demos but also made a Bomberman game called Kaboom. Music is important to all of these, so let's talk about music on the GS. I'll be focusing on stuff for musicians and programmers, but if you're just interested in 2GS sound in general, you should be fine here too. We're going to take a look at all the specifics of the 2GS and what to keep in mind when making music. NTP is about playing track music. This screenshot is from the Amiga Classic Pro Tracker. Music is written in spreadsheet style in columns or tracks. It's played line by line. Each cell of the spreadsheet can hold a note, an instrument number and effect data. Those effects can be fade the volume or slide to a different note or jump to a position in the spreadsheet and so on. There are more than 30 different effects available. The music is saved as a module or mod file. It was and still is a common way to make music. Now in the old days, because of the Amiga, only four tracks were allowed. Nowadays, programs like OpenMPT support many more tracks, which is perfect for us on the GS. Now NTP is two things. It's a converter for mod files into its own custom NTP format and a library to play the music back on the GS. The converter is also available online and more on that later. Um, it's all open source so you programmers out there can use the converter in your build pipeline or enhance the player itself or whatever. Now let's talk about the 2GS sound hardware. Unlike the graphics chip in the 2GS, the sound hardware is not a total disaster. The sound chip is the Insonic Dock and it's the successor to the famous Commodore 64 SID chip. It has 32 voices, which is fantastic, but only 64 kilobytes of wavetable sound RAM from which to play. Not great, but still, okay. That's my debugging tool on the GS. It's a live view of all the 32 oscillators. Each oscillator can be set to a certain frequency, with a certain volume, and play from a certain point in the sound RAM and with a certain length. The control register for each is a bit field. The rightmost bit is zero if the oscillator is playing and one if it is stopped. We can change this bit to turn the oscillator on or off. The next two bits are the mode that the oscillator is playing in. There is free run, where the oscillator plays its wave repeatedly, one shot, where the wave is played only once, and swap mode. With swap mode, an oscillator plays its wave and at the end stops and enables the oscillator next to it. And this works in both directions. There's also sync mode, but we don't need it. Also in the control register is a bit to trigger and interrupt when the oscillator has reached the end of the wave it is playing. That's very useful. The rest of the bits are the output channel. We can send the oscillator sound to one of eight channels here. Yes, I know it's four bits, so it could hold 16 different numbers, but the highest bit is not supported. On a mono system, all output goes out to the single speaker, never mind the channel. And for stereo, all left channels are mixed together and sent to the left speakers. And all right channels go out to the right speaker. And if you own one or two for Sonic cards, four or up to the final eight speakers are supported. That's pretty, pretty nice. When oscillators play a wave, they in fact read bytes from the sound RAM. Instrument data and mod files use signed byte values, while on the GS we use unsigned values. Zero bytes have a special meaning on the GS. Whenever an oscillator encounters a zero byte, it'll stop playing no matter what the mode it is running in is. Um, now there's a problem. Oscillators can only play waves of certain lengths. Only eight values are allowed. 256 bytes, 512 bytes, 1024 bytes, and so on. In fact, the largest wave that can be played is only half the size of the sound RAM. That's crazy. To take an example, if our instrument is 6000 bytes long, we have to set up the oscillator to play a wave of 8192 bytes. And to force the oscillator to stop after 6000 bytes, we add stop our zero bytes at the end. Okay, but what about looped instruments? In a module, you can set a repeat pointer for each instrument. If it points to the beginning of the wave, the whole instrument is looped. If the repeat pointer is somewhere in the wave, you end up with a header and a loop like here. Now, how can we play this instrument with our oscillators? We split up the instrument into two separate waves, the header and the loop itself. We use an oscillator pair, an even numbered A and an odd numbered B. 
A, place the header in swap mode and B, only the loop also in swap mode. Now A is done, starts B and fires an interrupt. We use the interrupt to set up A to play the loop next. During this time B is playing. Now B is finished and swaps to A and A is finished and swaps to B and this keeps on going and the loop is played endlessly. However, if the loop is of an ideal size, like 256 bytes, 512 and so on, we can have B in free run mode. So A swaps to B and B plays the loop on its own endlessly. This is way better. This doesn't require an interrupt and it also sounds better. Wait, what? Why does it sound better? Well, I'm glad you asked. Remember this screen? The Insonic will go through the oscillators one by one. Each oscillator will pick its byte from the wave it is playing. Now we have an oscillator pair in swap mode, C and D here. If the even numbered oscillator C reaches the end of its wave, it will stop and deliver nothing. But now the partner oscillator D is started immediately and uh, picks its byte and this will result in a continuous sound. However, if D has finished playing, it is supposed to start C again, but the Insonic just walks on to the next oscillator. This means that for a brief moment there is no sound bite from either C or D. Depending on the situation, this can result in nasty click sounds. And for further reading, this problem is covered in Apple IIGS Tech Note number 11. The click sound can be mitigated by making sure the swap happens near a silence crossing in the wave. So if the original instrument looks like this, I know it's silly, but still, the NTP converter will try to make the header longer and rotate the loop so that the end of the loop is near a silence crossing. Also, if loops are very short, they are repeated so the click happens less often. But really, the only way to prevent this and to get the best sound quality, make sure your loops have an ideal size. If you forget everything about the talk, this is the one thing to remember. Check your loop size. Now we have to talk about how the oscillators play their waves. Each oscillator has its own pointer into the sound ram, the so-called accumulator. To determine the exact place where the oscillator reads from is complicated and I'm not angry with you if you skip this and get yourself a beer or something. First we have to set a wave size. Let's start with 256 bytes. There's also the so-called address bus resolution. Let's leave this at zero for now. Now the oscillator's pointer register points to a page in the 64K sound RAM. Hex B2 in our example here. When we start the oscillator, it'll start to play from B200. It picks its byte and moves to the next location. This is done by simply adding the value from the 16-bit frequency register to the oscillator's 24-bit accumulator. See the green bits of the accumulator? These bits form the lower part of the final address. Now the addition is done and the next final address is B201. The oscillator picks another byte from the wave and the addition is performed again and again and so on. Now when we set the wave size to 512 bytes, the pointer register loses one bit and the missing bit is now taken also from the accumulator. Notice that the address can no longer be on any page. It must be aligned on a 512 byte boundary. That's an important constraint to keep in mind. For 1024 byte, the auth boundary is also 1024 and so on up until 32K. What about the other thing, the address bus resolution? it'll change the selection of bits in the accumulator. As you can see, it has shifted to the left. This may look strange at first, but it's very useful. By setting the address bus resolution to match the wave size, NTP can use the same node frequency table for every wave. Why does this work? Well, every time the wave size is doubled, we simply halve the frequency value. Not easy to understand when you hear it the first time, just let it sink in. Now I know that was quite a lot of stuff and we are not done yet, but no worries, everything that you heard so far is covered by NTP. The NTP converter will convert instruments, you know, the shifting of the byte values, it'll add stopper bytes automatically, split instruments if they are looped, 
pick the optimal oscillator modes like swap mode, free run, one shot, and it'll take into consideration if waves are of an ideal size. It will try to mitigate the swap mode bug as we've seen before, and it will arrange the instruments in sound RAM. Remember, the lengths can only be 256 bytes, 512 bytes, I keep repeating myself. And they have to be placed only on boundaries of the same value. Now here we start with the largest instrument, the blue one. These are the four places where we can put it. And since the RAM is empty, it is placed at the beginning. Now the pink instrument has eight possible locations, but the first two are already occupied, so it is placed here. Next, the green instrument. Now the red instrument can only be placed on a four-page boundary. Since the other instruments leave some extra space at the end, we can fit the red one in between like this. Nice. Reminds me of a game I used to play. Forgot the name. Well, anyway, as you can see, some space is wasted and there is a lot of interdependency of the instruments and their lengths. So it may well be that your mod has less than 64K of instrument data, but it doesn't fit in 2GS sound RAM. If it just doesn't fit, NTP offers streaming. Streaming means that pieces of the instruments are copied into sound RAM while they are being played. For each track of a module, a stream buffer is allocated, 512 bytes each. And for each streaming buffer, two oscillators are needed, A and B. Both are started at the same time, with the same frequency and in free run mode. Now A plays the wave, that's what is heard. While it is playing, the next chunk of the instrument is copied into a filled buffer, shown as blue here. Um, B is running silently and only half the buffer. When it reaches the end, it fires an interrupt, and that's the signal that the buffer has to switch. And in that way, instruments of any length can be played. Nice. Streaming is amazing, um, but it's not without issues. On the pro side, streaming does not have to deal with the sound RAM limitations. Streaming is what makes the GS able to play almost any four track module that's out there. The module effect number nine, the sample offset, is only available to streamed instruments. It allows the module composer to play from uh, anywhere within an instrument, and we can't do that with sound RAM based instruments. Now you know why. On the con side, streaming eats processor time massively. You won't be using this in a game with a lot of sprites moving on the screen at the same time. Also, I have no idea of how many tracks can be streamed in parallel. You're kind of on your own here. Now, over the years, NTP changed quite a bit. Version 1.0 and 1.1 were the initial release and the bug fixed version. 1.2 is what we used in our No Hard Feelings demo from 2021. Instruments could only be placed in sound RAM, which was good enough at the time, and it supported 15 tracks, up to 15 tracks. And why 15? One oscillator is used as a timer for reading music notes, you know, the spreadsheet, that leaves 31 oscillators, and since every track requires two oscillators, we ended up with 15 tracks. So for no hard feelings, our musician Dreamer created a module with 15 tracks. And thanks to the online converter, he made sure um, it works on the GS. Streaming was an itch that I finally managed to scratch in version 1.3. Back in the 90s, many other players already supported streaming. Noise Tracker was the first, later came Sonic Tracker, Shellplay, Mega Tracker and others. Also new in version 1.3 was channel doubling. It can be enabled when playing music and it will double the amount of oscillators that each track uses. Each voice gets an extra voice on the other channel, left, right, with half the volume, making playback sound much nicer, especially on headphones. The latest thing in version 1.4 is the support for up to 31 tracks, so from 15 to 31. Yes, it's a bit crazy, but since the GS can do it, NTP supports it. Let's take a quick look. Before this change, it was simple. Each track of a module required exactly two oscillators, but now it's complicated. So first it is determined which instruments require how many oscillators, one or two. Then NTP checks which tracks contain which instruments, and from that it emerges that a track either requires one or two oscillators. Typically, drum tracks are one oscillator tracks if the drums can be placed in sound RAM. Okay, back to version 1.4. 
Um, also news that you as a programmer can set the master volume for music. This is independent from the overall sound volume. It's very useful if you want to offer mo uh, music volume setting in your game. There's also an NTP library call to stream a sound alongside music maybe for a game sound effect or something. And last but not least, the conversion information. It's a text file with useful information about your music and what the converter felt it had to do with it. That's the converter output, really. Let's try out the converter and see what happens. Now, if you go to ninjaforce.com slash NTP, you're taken to the Ninja Tracker Plus homepage where you can choose a module file from your hard drive to be converted. Now, the next thing to think about is whether you want to have all the instruments into the 2GS sound RAM. If that's the case, then you want to forbid streaming. If you press convert with this module, this will result in errors because the instruments are too much, too large for the 2GS sound RAM. You get some information of how to reduce instrument sizes, but for this module, I don't want to touch it. I'm going to allow streaming, pick up the module file again, press convert, and now I get a zip file with the NTP file inside and the conversion information. The conversion information can be displayed by ticking this box, press convert again, and now you get a list of the instruments and how many oscillators they require. There's information which instruments have to be streamed. Usually the larger instruments have to be streamed. And for the non-streamed instruments, you can find a pointer into the sound RAM where the instrument is placed. Down here, you have the memory map of which areas are used for what in the 2GS sound RAM, and you can see some space is still free. Down here, there's the oscillator usage, which track is played by which oscillator. And yeah, as you can see, this is a standard classic Amiga Pro Tracker module. So we have lots of oscillators free on the 2GS. And notice that oscillator 31 is always required for the music timer. Now, if I have a more specific tune to the Apple 2GS module, like this one, it's made by Dreamer, 15 tracks. If I save this as a Pro Tracker module, Go to the web page again, pick this module. I can forbid streaming because I know everything fits into sound RAM. If I press convert, you see no errors. Um, the instruments all fit into sound RAM, nothing is streamed. The sound RAM is packed, as you can see here. We are using many more oscillators, and but still some are free. So now let's go over to 2GS and listen to how this sounds. Okay, so here we are on the Apple IIGS and I just launched the newly released Sensei Play, which I can use to play the module I just converted. And it sounds a bit like this. So to sum up what we have so far, programmers need to figure out what they need music for. If you're drawing a lot to screen, better choose the music that fits into sound RAM. Also, do you need some extra space for sound effects? Do you need extra oscillators to play them? Musicians, on the other hand, want to make sure the loop size is of an ideal length, always. Your programmer will let you know if you have to squeeze all the instruments into 64K or not. And you also have to talk about the number of tracks you may use. The GS has many, so use them. Alright, now whenever somebody gives a talk about how things work, you can be sure they're skipping over the nasty bits they had to deal with on the way. For instance, debugging is done by, well, listening to the same music over and over again. If you know the song very well, that's fine, but if you get the music, say, four days before you have to hand in your demo at a demo competition, the best thing you can do is to record what the GS is playing and send the recording to the musician, which we did for No Hard Feelings. And Dreamer got back to me and reported that some drums were not played. Great. 
There are two drum beats here shortly after one another. The first one was played, the second was not. By the way, it only happened on real hardware, not in the emulator. Now, when a new note has to be played, the oscillators are stopped, then instrument, frequency, volume, etc. are set and the oscillator is started again. However, it is the same instrument running at the same frequency. What was I doing wrong? It turns out I was stopping the oscillator but setting it to free run mode at the same time. Yes, the oscillator is halted, but the pointer in the wave is preserved apparently, you know, the accumulator. So when the oscillator was started again, it played from the rest of the instrument, which was the silent ending of the drum, and no second drum beat was heard. Had the drum sound been shorter, we wouldn't have spotted the issue because the sample had already ended and the wave pointer would have been resetted already. So the right thing to do is to stop the oscillator by halting it and setting one shot mode at the same time. That's a test case for emulators right there. The next thing was this. In this module, the composer starts a looped instrument in channel 4 and lets it keep on playing. By changing the volume, it sounds as if the instrument is restarted. This is how it sounds. And this is how it sounded on the GS. Now, I don't really know what's going on. The instrument is looped and not of an ideal size, so my guess is that we are running into the swap mode problem again. There was no obvious solution, so NTP has a special case and will restart the instrument in this situation. This is bad because it might ruin another module. Next, I tried to optimize the code that talks to the Insonic Dock. I was pretty sure I did not do anything wrong in my code, but all of a sudden it sounded weird. To find out what was going on, I recorded the video and slowly stepped through it frame by frame. And yes, there it was. The frequency here is to be the same for both oscillators, and clearly it was not. What's going on there? This is a module with four tracks. Every track requires two adjacent as, uh, oscillators. I was positive my code wrote the same frequency values for both oscillators, so how can this be? Believe it or not, my code was too fast. Never thought anything on a GS can be too fast, but here it is. In order to talk to the sound chip as fast as possible, NTP sets the direct page to C000, which allows um, accessing the Insonic dock registers with faster direct page or zero page instructions. Also, auto increment is used. Quick explanation here. Writing to sound drum is done by setting a pointer register and then writing a byte to the data register. That byte then appears in sound drum at the pointer location. And with auto increment on, writing to sound drum will automatically move the pointer one byte forward. It's very useful when streaming and it works with registers too. Now if you take these two things together, sometimes the interface to the Insonic can't keep up and some writes are lost. There are many ways to fix this. You can um, add, um, you can listen to the busy flag of the dog, or you can add sleep statements. Now I went back and disabled all the uh, the auto increment mode. Now the increment has to be done by code, and the dog can keep up. Okay, um, here is a list of things that would be interesting for the future development of NTP. First off, the mod format which NTP uses as its source is limited to 31 instruments, while NTP format allows 255 instruments. Maybe this can be fixed by supporting another um, format like S3M or others. Other formats might also allow instruments that are composed of attack, decay, sustain and release parts. It might be possible to support that, but it would be a lot of work. Now, somewhere in France, there's a GS with 128k sound RAM, and maybe some clever hardware guys come up with a kit or something that, that you upgrade your GS in the same way. I could see NTP support that extra sound memory. The last item on the list, register streams, would be um, another radical change for NTP. It would mean that the converter would transform the music not into another spreadsheet format, but instead into a compressed stream of uh, dock register changes. The NTP player would then only need to decompress from the stream and make the dock register changes. The player would be faster and smaller. It's a concept already tested on Amiga and seems to work fine. Okay, what have we learned so far? GS sound is special. 
but you know now how to get the most out of what we have on the GS. Also, use NTP for your project, really. It supports almost everything that the GS can do, so you can make music especially for the GS instead of doing just another conversion. And finally, get in touch if you have questions or issues. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the deep dive into GS Sound. I certainly had a lot of fun making this video. Bye bye.